to everyone. So I'm, I'm still letting people in. We're 28 people at the moment, and I'm sure people are still coming in. And I'm also responding to, um, well, chats in the, in the chat box. So for those who has been with us uh, last week, um, when we spoke about energy um, and your eco footprint um, around energy and um, the alter what is the alternatives, we'll basically do the same thing today, looking at water um, as a natural resource. But, um, well, not but, we are a multi-faith organization, as most of you know. So we will start the session with a prayer. And I've asked um, Mrs. Gurupira from Zimbabwe um, to start us with. Her audio is still connecting. And then after her, um, I have asked Reverend um, uh, Mugambo if he could then continue with the prayer. Good morning, Tendai. Good morning, Zainab. How, are, How you? are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing fine. Good. Please, could you mm -hmm. start off uh, with a prayer and then we'll go to Reverend Mugambo. Okay, thank you. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come to you this morning as earth keepers. We want to thank you for giving us this opportunity to learn and share, to be good at keepers and to be able to conserve water. We want to thank you, uh, God, for this organization. Oh my God. We want to ask you, God, to continue to bless our leaders in this organization and give them more wisdom so that they continue giving us as faith leaders. Help us, Lord, continue to give us the wisdom as faith leaders to help others and continue to give them the light and the knowledge uh, to our fellow members. Bless this webinar today. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Reverend Mungambo. Okay. Lord, we want to thank you and bless your holy name so much for each one of us that we are able to gather over this technology and be able to learn and share together concerning your creation. Indeed, you created this world to be a paradise for us to live in, but because of our fallenness, Instead of keeping it as a, a paradise for our welfare, many times we disturb it and the, we make it hostile. And Lord, we ask you to forgive us where instead of taking care of the creation you gave to us, we have vandalized it and we've made it uncomfortable for other people to live in and even for future generations. <clears throat> so precious Lord, we come to you asking for your forgiveness that you will forgive us and give us your grace again for us to be able to stand in the place of dominion which you created us to be, that we can have dominion to take care of your world. Today, as we talk about water, we thank you so much because you are the one who created this earth and you gathered the waters in the seas, you gathered the waters up in the skies, and you grant us the fountains of water, and indeed even know that you are the living water. Through your own son, the scriptures tell us that you are the one who gives us the living water for us to be able to flourish. You are the one who brings rain from the sky that he, the grower can have, can plant seed and be able to grow it. And for all these blessings, we are grateful to you. For this time that we are learning together and sharing, we thank you so much for Safse as they lead us and guide us into this, Lord. Help us indeed to be good caretakers, good stewards of the wonderful creation which you created for our good, 
and that also we may honor you. We thank you, we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you both for that, for that wonderful, wonderful prayer. Um, Safsi really appreciates your, your prayers for us as well, trying to do this work during very, very difficult times. Um, before I go to Francesca de Gaspres, who's our ED, um, to open us, I'd just like to ask, there are a few, few people that came in with, um, with no names on their accounts. Um, like I tell a 16 and 435, we, we need to know who's in the, who's on the score um, and the names of people that have joined us. So please, if your name is not on your Zoom account, please, can you change that? If you're not sure how to change it, please write your name um, in the chat box and I can see and then change it for you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Francesca. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Zainab. That's so important. We want to be able to support you to join us. But if we don't know who you are, then we can't do our audit. So we do, we don't just do um, eco audits, we also do um, data audits. And it's very, very important that we know who you are so that we can continue to say yes. Um, this person joined us, yes, we know they were there. So it's how Chlo is keeping track of all of us. Um, and that's why we must each have our names. So thank you, Zainab. Um, and thanks everyone. Um, it's great to be here this morning. I want to give special thanks to Emmanuel and Tendai for their wonderful prayers to remind us that we are earth keepers this morning. Um, and also a special welcome to Kim, who's our technical person who's going to be taking us through the second session. Um, and yeah, I, I love getting a chance to speak in these sessions. So whenever Zainab says, are you wanting to speak this time? I'm always keen because um, I love to get a chance to connect with you all. Um, one of the difficulties of COVID has been that we've had to move online and it's been incredibly difficult for SAFSI here in South Africa. We have just gone into another lockdown. We're at lockdown level four, which means most of us are trying to work from home and we have to be very careful because our COVID numbers are very, very high right now. Um, and so I want to just send strength to everyone who's dealing with a difficult time right now in South Africa and elsewhere. I'm sure that many other countries also have COVID challenges. And the silver lining in the big cloud that has been COVID, one of the silver linings has been, is that we can open these meetings up to our regional brothers and sisters our regional earth keepers, that we are now able, we don't try and do everything face to face as we did in the past, which of course was a much smaller audience. Now we can be online together, we can listen to each other in this space and we can learn together. So we, it's a real privilege that there are so many new earth keepers who are part of our group coming in from Zambia and Malawi. And I love that everyone's writing their names in the chat. So we can really appreciate everyone from around. I think at the moment, from what I can tell, it looks like we've got very strong Malawi, South Africa, Zambia. Um, we've got, I think we've got some Zimbabwe. Um, but if there's any other countries that I've missed out, please do write your name in the chat so we can appreciate you. And and greet you and acknowledge your, your presence here today. We're so impressed by the interest and the desire to do this kind of eco footprinting, this kind of eco auditing. And some people sometimes say, well, how, what has that got to do with being a person of faith? Or what has that got to do with our faith institution? And um, for SAFSI from our work, from our journey on this issue, we believe that we are called through the sacred texts of our faith to care for earth. That is in fact the vision of Safsi, people of faith caring for living earth. And earth is a sacred mother, earth as a living being, earth as part of us and to heal that relationship. 
And what does that mean? Well, it means how, what, how do, do we work in relationship to the water? And we know for all our religions, water is a sacred body. It's a sacred part of the earth. It cleanses us. It nourishes us. It replenishes us. And in fact, as, you, as we all know, our bodies are made up of 70% of water. So it really is us. We are water. So it gives me great pleasure to hand back to um, Zainab to welcome you all to have an, yet another stimulating conversation about how do we look after water as a sacred body, but also in a very practical way for our faith institution. Maybe we don't have enough water where we are. I know some of you are in quite dry locations. In Cape Town, we've got a week of solid rain and we've had, I think, over 40 uh, millimeters where I am this morning alone, which is a lot of rain. Um, it, we expect an, a, a winter rainfall, but what we're seeing with climate change is that rain is coming in strange times, torrential rains, weird times of the year so that our crops get affected. And these are some of the challenges that we have of water. How do we keep the sacred relationship with water despite the impacts of climate change, despite the difficulties that we face where water is now seen as a commodity? So I'm going to hand back to Zainab and then I'm sure Kim, who are going to help us navigate both the sacredness of water and how, you know, really, how do we just have enough water to do what we need to do in our faith institutions? Thank you, Zainab, and thank you all. Thank you, Francesca. Um, let me just uh, say that many people didn't receive the um, program for today, but as last week, we will have our um, eco audit specialist um, speaking next, which is Kim Krishna, and she will speak. Um, on the context of, of South Africa and, and beyond. Um, we will also have a speaker from Zimbabwe, um, two speakers from Zimbabwe and one from Malawi. And then we'll go on to um, questions and answers after that. But obviously your questions and questions and comments are welcome in the chat box. So we can just read them out at the end. Uh, so with that, I will hand over to Kim. Good morning, Kim. Good morning, everybody. It's really great to be back, as Zainab said, from a cold, wet Cape Town. But it's really exciting to connect with you all across Southern Africa. And as I was putting this um, webinar or my PowerPoint together, I was realizing something that has been a growing awareness. In the cities, many of us have been so comfortable with the availability of water that we've taken it for granted. But um, with climate change impacting on our big dams and our availability of water, with food security issues in our cities becoming more and more relevant, <clears throat> we're starting to look at examples of what people are doing in rural communities and in rural communities right across Africa to secure water and food. So while I'm going to tell you about um, how to look at water footprints and and what actually is involved in using water and how to be efficient with water. At the same time, I'm really excited to learn from the, the other presenters about how they're being efficient with water and how they're building, building water resilience. And that also relates directly to building food resilience because our cities are changing and our relationship in the city with our essential services is changing um, very dramatically, and we need to learn from positive examples everywhere so that we can build resilient um, cities. So on that note, I'm going to go into the PowerPoint. Um, maybe, yeah, just a quick reminder for those of you who were not with us last week, SAPSI has this um, eco audit booklet that helps you to, um, it's a toolkit for measuring water and energy and, um, and waste and how to reduce the, reduce your consumption of all of those. We're not gonna go through it in detail in this PowerPoint. Um, I'm just gonna to touch on key aspects, but um, the link to the book is in the PowerPoint presentation and we'll also put it in the chat for people who want to get down to the real nitty gritty of exactly how to measure in liters the different um, water that you're using 
for the garden, for the kitchen elsewhere so that you can work out how to reduce that and reuse it because a very good way of reducing is to keep reusing water. If we, if we wash dishes, rinse them, we shower, the, that water is perfect for the garden. So yeah, so that's also part of reducing is how to reuse. So I'm going to do a screen share Zainab so that we can go into the PowerPoint. Sorry. I don't know why it brings up every single thing I've been involved in recently. Oh, there it is. <laughs> no. Can you see my screen? Yes, we yes we can. Okay. Sorry. Let me just. Right. Okay. Um. So yeah, we're talking about water and this photograph on the side is particularly relevant to me because uh, many of you will be aware that we had a very serious drought in Cape Town from the end of, um, well, the whole of 2017 and 2018. And in fact, it wasn't just Cape Town, it ex extended right across vast areas of South Africa. The Eastern Cape is still in a very serious drought. And there were also parts of Zimbabwe um, and I think even Malawi that were affected by the same climate change phenomena that caused this very serious drought in Cape Town. So while we at home were careful with our water use, we only really, really got a deep, deep sense of how precious water was when the city said in January of 2018, by um, the 1st of April, if we don't get rains, we are turning the taps off and people will all have to go and fetch water um, from water points. So this picture is my daughter and my neighbor who we had a pipe burst. <laughs> and suddenly um, there was this water gushing down the street and everybody came out to collect as much water as they possibly could, which yeah, is just such a wake up call. We see all these cartoons of people crossing deserts with no water and vultures wheeling overhead. Well, this was the local urban um, example of what it feels like to realize that you could actually open the tap and nothing will come out. And I realized that right across Africa, there are people who don't even have access to taps. So the water cycle and our life cycle are inextricably linked. Um, we talk about the earth as a blue planet with lots and lots of water but only 2.5% of that water is fresh. And actually most of that fresh water is tied up in ice. So the available water that we have isn't um, anything like what it looks like when we see pictures of the earth from space. And when we're sitting in Cape Town with the rain pouring out of the sky for days on end. But we do need to remember that nature needs water too. And we need nature. So for healthy nature, um, we need to, make sure that we're not polluting our water. And healthy nature means healthy humans. I showed the slide last time, but I'm not sure how many presentation. So I would just like to quickly go through it again. Um, essentially it shows that while the earth has resources to meet um, human well-being, it doesn't have resources for excessive consumption. So at the top, you can see um, the blue arrow, which includes water, plants, animals, and you can see how our demand on resources is declining our resources. Um, and also the ecosystem services. Clean water is an ecosystem service. Um, when we pollute it, we have to use energy or we have to go and buy bottled water. And that is extremely costly. We have to use energy to clean it or we have to use energy to produce bottled water. That's extremely costly and has other environmental um, impacts. So, so while the resource base is decreasing, our demands are increasing. Um, but you can see that if we start becoming aware of how we use resources, we can reopen the funnel at, at the end over here. So it's not that these arrows need to meet and that's the end of human civilization. We are intelligent species and we can make the right choices. We just need to be aware about what they are and then be motivated to make those choices. 
Um, so water, we all know about the water cycle. It, the water evaporates off the seas, the clouds blow over land, and it rains. But we actually can inter, intervene. And in a lot of the world, we've actually been intervening in the water cycle in ways that are creating deserts. Um, sadly, history's got many stories of how deforestation has caused deserts and has destroyed past civilizations. Um, in Greece before, um, in about 700 BC, before Christ, um, there was a massive trade in, in making bronze and the, to smelt the, the tin and the copper to make the bronze, they deforestated deforested vast areas of the Mediterranean. And there are islands like Cyprus that still hasn't recovered. There are parts of Turkey that haven't recovered. There are also stories about how um, ancient Iran was, was um, the Garden of Eden. And um, through human inter interaction or interference and also slowly um, drying out of the climate, the vast parts of that of the, the whole Middle East that are now deserts. And it's not entirely because of the drying out. So if we keep planting vegetation, you can see in the picture here, it creates a high humidity zone and it creates rain. So we create a create a local cycle of um, that that protects our water supply. On the other side, you can see that this has other advantages as well. We improve the climate, it improves all the living conditions, and it creates a wider um, range of econ economic activities. So specifically, we were talking about water footprints and eco audits of the footprints. So there's two aspects to our water footprint. The one is exactly how much water do you and I use directly? That means when I turn the tap on, when I go and fetch water from a stream or a well or a borehole, that is the direct footprint for my daily water consumption. Um, but then there are other water footprints that we don't always think about. And that is water is used to produce our food, our clothing, our books, our appliances, even energy. We know about hydroelectricity, but we also need water to cool um, nuclear power plants, we need water to cool fossil fuel um, power plants. So water is actually in everything. And that's the hidden use of water. I just want to give an example of how huge this can be. This is a British example, so it wouldn't apply to most of Africa. Um, and I hope it doesn't apply to South African um, high and middle income homes, but I suspect it probably does. Um, so three 1,500 liters of water a day. That is, that is made up of 150 liters that people use in their home, the so-called direct use, like having a shower, washing the dishes, drinking water, watering the garden. And then the rest of that um, 3,500 liters is in our choices about the foods we eat, because some foods have a very high water footprint. And it's also about the choices of our clothing, just look at this for example. Um, the water demand of cotton versus hemp. I've been a little bit um, provocative and chosen this example directly because um, hemp is an ancient um, natural fiber that was used for clothing, for making sails, for ropes. And it has got a bad rap because of marijuana, but actually the hemp that you use for clothing does not have those CBC oils and the chemicals that people um, that people are looking for when they either want to smoke hemp or use it as a medicinal product. So if you just look at the water footprint, we basically need to change our clothing from from organic cotton to organic hemp. The other thing about hemp, it sounds like I'm promoting it in a way I am. It doesn't use the pesticides that cotton uses um, because it's a much more robust plant and pesticides translate directly into polluted water as well. So I just think it's really important for us to understand that our water use isn't just what we do when we turn the tap on and drink a glass of water or have a shower. So this is what your daily guide should be to water. This is endorsed by the United Nations. So it's per person, 50 liters, 
per person, which includes 10 liters of washing, which is actually quite a lot um, in Cape Town during the drought. Um, we learned what so many people in Africa always knew, that a, a five liter bucket of water is more than enough water than you need to wash with. But of course, before that, if you were lucky enough to be in a, a house with a municipal water supply, you just turned on the shower and stood there for 10 minutes or whatever. So um, these just give you an indication of how our daily water needs can, can do not need to add up to more than 50 liters. Um, and for people in our South African townships, you carry water from a, with a bucket from home, they, uh, from a tap, communal tap to their homes. They're certainly not even using 50 liters of water per person. So, yeah. So I just wanted to quickly refer you to the SAPC um, guidebook again. You can measure your water use of the different activities and appliances. Um, and it also tells you how you can reuse water and save water. So there are um, United Nations water rights and responsibilities. And in fact, the South African constitution also lists our water rights quite clearly, but all South Africans have the right to, cl to clean water and to food. Um, and the United Nations Sustainability Goal 6 is to ensure access to water and sanitation for all. Of course, um, in many parts of the world, um, the situation on the ground falls short of, of what's actually of this goal. Our responsibilities, which is what the eco footprinting, footprinting is about, is to use water wisely, reduce water pollution. Remember, I said only 2.6% of fresh water on the earth um, is actually drinking water, fresh water. So we mustn't pollute what we have. And then store water. So what are the key water issues? Access to clean drinking water. Not everybody has access to safe clean tap water and there are huge health implications associated with this, especially for children. And buying bottled water is expensive. And then we end up with all the plastic implications. Boiling water, is also expensive and it ends up with, with cost, environmentally costly um, energy implications, especially if you're using wood um, to, to boil water. Waste, so we waste water often, um, those of us who have easy access to it. So we need to look at efficient use and reuse. Every drop counts. And then increasing pollution of our precious water from homes, from industry and mining is obviously reducing the availability. So access to clean water, um, what are some of the options? These are community rain tanks where people get together in a community and build a, the old tra 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 traditional brick and cement rain tank. Um, there are, and I saw some of these in Malawi where a faith center had put in a well point um, with a pump for the local community. And then of course there are rain tanks in our droughts in Cape Town, we literally ran out of rain tanks. They had to be, they were, they were being trucked in on these amazing trucks with long trailers with tanks all stacked up to try and, try and bring in rain tanks for people's households. And also some of the faith centers with very large roofs put up rain tanks, which their community could then use. Um, I'm pleased to see that later on in the presentation this morning, somebody's going to talk about boreholes. So boreholes are one way boreholes and well points, one way of getting um, water. But remember, the water that goes into the ground comes from our rain. And if we take out more than the rain is putting in, um, you actually drop the water table so that this is the water table. You can see there's a small well over here and this big one that's pumping like crazy has lowered the water table to this level so that all the other wells have dried up. Um, that is definitely not community minded and it's not good for the environment because all the surface trees start to dry, die because the groundwater level has dropped. So alternatives are to, it's called planting the rain and I did talk about it in the earlier slide, um, where you actually create um, depressions to, um, to trap the rain when it falls and to soak it into the ground rather than letting it run off into 
through the streets in the stormwater channels and into rivers and out to sea. Of course, we do need the rain in our rivers and out to sea, but um, we need an ecological reserve, but we don't need, we can trap quite a lot of it and let it go back into our groundwater. So you can see you can do it by getting trapping street runoff and you can do it by designing around your home basins to collect rainwater. And you can also put your grain water, your grey water into those basins. So um, looking at efficiency, toilets are a terrible waste of drinking water. Um, so put reduce the size of the cisterns. Um, you now get modern cisterns with very, very tiny bowls that work very well. Um, but if you have an old one, like most of us do in old buildings, either put a brick in or a, or a pet bottle filled with water so that instead of flushing um, 11 or nine liters, you're now going to flush, depending on the size of the bottle, if it's a two liter bottle, then you're flushing seven or nine liters, which is every time you flush that adds up to a lot of water. When you shower, um, catch the water in a basin. Um, and the same applies to when, you, when you're doing washing, you can catch the rinse water and reuse it. So this is a Methodist church in Cape Town. They have put a basin in their sink and all that um, rinse water they put into the garden. This is typical, I'm just gonna go through this quickly um, because it's also in the SAPSI guidebook, but um, you can just see how much water the different appliances use. So toilets, when you flush a number of times a day, use a huge amount. Showers, depending on how long you shower, another huge amount. Baths, um, yeah, baths should really not be used at all, um, unless you're going to leave the water in the bath and then scoop it out for the garden or other, or to wash the car or to wash the floors. Dishwasher, there are lots of debates about whether washing by hand or using a modern dishwasher, which one uses the least amount of water. It's possible that a modern dishwasher uses less, but the disadvantage of a modern dishwasher is that you can't save the rinse water, where you can when you wash by hand. You have a basin for washing and you have a basin for rinsing, and all that rinse water you can reuse. Um, yeah, and then of course the garden hose, yeah, um, which when we need water wise plants in our garden and only to water in the early morning and the late evening so that we don't have most of our water evaporating. Then pollution, pollution of our precious water. What we put into the environment comes back to bite us in every aspect. The, the picture on the right shows somebody just um, spraying presumably pesticides or herbicides. There are a lot of safe alternatives, natural alternatives. Um, and there you can see the link between the the pesticide sprayer and the poor person inside drinking the tap water. Um, and a lot of our modern filtration systems are battling to take out some of the, um, some of the chemicals in our water, uh, some of the chemicals that are getting into our groundwater and our rivers. Apparently we even are drinking microplastics. Um, and then the other one, which is maybe becomes a little bit more controversial, but it's critically important is to design toilets so that they kill bacteria and filter out pollution. Um, and sadly, in a lot of um, communities that don't have modern services, the um, well point is in a village where there are also a lot of not even proper septic tanks, but just pit toilets. So then the bacterial load ends up in the, in the water. Um, if people are interested in this, we can send information afterwards, but, um, but composting, in fact, in the Cape Town drought, a lot of people then started looking at composting toilets. This is ours. It works. It's amazing. It doesn't even smell. When the bucket, this is just a big 25 liter paint bucket. When it's full, you put a lid on it. You leave it um, outside for um, two months. And then you put this, the, what ends up just being a dark, like foresty mulch. You put it at the around your trees or you can put it at the bottom of the compost pit and then let it recompost but it doesn't actually even need that low tech the only thing we bought was a toilet seat the rest is a old paint bucket and some scraps of wood um and i promise you it doesn't smell so this is how it's designed um you 
you have to separate the solids and the liquids so you may, you can't wee in it otherwise it, that creates there are there are composting toilets that cope with that but then that it's much more complicated um, and I'm sure that the guys from Malawi like Sheikh Qasim will be able to tell you that urine is very valuable and it kept separately they use it as a fertilizer so we can yeah I think that's I just wanted to give you this concept um, idea because the other thing is that you can take the manure and add it to your biodigester, and then you can create an energy source as well. There are lots of eco-friendly cleaning um, materials, vinegar, lemon juice, ordinary bicarb, um, soap without all sorts of um, softeners and scents are much, much better than a lot of the chemicals that are, we're being sold to clean our homes with. And all of these chemicals ultimately end up in the, in the water system. So it's better to use natural ones that break down. Do we really value our precious water? Um, this is just, this is a photograph from Cape Town showing what happens after big rains. All the plastic and rubbish from the streets end up in our rivers and they end up on our beaches. And here's a group of students busy cleaning up the beaches. I'd like to just show you this case study. How am I doing for time, Zainab? <laughs> um, I'd like to show you this case study of a community in Nepal. Um, this is a before, and it's not an uncommon scene. You can see a lady, she doesn't have an alternative. There's no way to dispose of wastewater. And this is not toilet water. This is from, from the home, from washing. So she pours it into the street. Um, and these are examples of channels um, some are dug and some are natural, and this is what they end up looking like. They create lots of problems because children like playing in water and then the children get sick. Um, so this is the old situation at Langrich, um, where the polluted situation, the community in desperation started digging little pits and linking them up with pipes to go away from the community to the local streams. Those local streams took the water into the Berg River. Um, and the Berg River became polluted. And then the um, importers who were buying our, our citrus and our fruit said, we're not going to buy from, because the, water, the, um, the river that is feeding, they're irrigating the citrus and the fruit is too polluted. So what happens in one small community can have international implications. So overseas market wasn't buying our fruit, farmers then had to do something. Um, the community said we've got massive health issues, so they worked together with um, a biomimicry group called Flow and Genius of Space, and they redesigned the, the uh, pits where people could pour the water into. They linked those up to, um, to graveled areas where the water filtered through, but there were plants there absorbing all the nutrients and breaking down some of the bacteria. These went into tree pits, which carried on doing that. And all of these ultimately then ended up draining the water into the little streams, but by then the water was clean. So it, it addressed those um, problems. There is a link on this slide and we can I can share it as well to show that project in detail. The community were very involved um, and here they are planting trees um, as you saw in those um, filter pits. So issues raised before by faith leaders of unsafe drinking water, bad service delivery, droughts causing water cuts, affordability is a problem, low efficiency in old buildings where there's still things like baths, not showers and toilets with huge cisterns. We have rainwater, but we let it run away. And then outside toilets um, with no dignity for the people who have to use them. So would it help if we had community-based water plans? Community level understanding of water issues means that the community can support households to be more water efficient. We can learn from each other. It can encourage care for local streams and dams for the local water, the natural resources all around us. It can support households that have problem with access to water. 
and it provides an informed framework where the community can then go to the authorities and say, this is our situation based on a real understanding and we need you now to, to address service delivery of clean drinking water and waste management. So what is the role of faith communities in being a catalyst to facilitate this? Um, <clears throat> what can individuals do? Be water wise, use water efficiently, report burst pipes and water leaks, manage your waste so that and the chemicals so we don't pollute our natural water systems and catch as, catch as much rainwater as you can. Um, just about leaks. Leaks are a terrible waste of water. Um, again, I'll refer you back to the SAPSI book because it actually tells you how to look for leaks and it's really important. The, um, all of our local authorities use huge, lose huge amounts of water through leaks and so do households. Um, so check all your taps and toilets and the geyser for, um, for water that keeps dripping. Um, then there are invisible leaks underground. Those are not so easy to find. That's why you need to know where your water meter is. You switch off all your taps at home and then you go and look at the water meter and it's still turning over. It means that you have a leak. Um, and then you need to get somebody in to come and help look for that leak and fix it. So water, more than anything else, connects us to the web of life. Up to 60% of our body is water. And while our bones only contain 31%, our hearts and our brains have 30, uh, have 73% um, water in them. So when we look after water, we look after all life. And the slide I showed before, but just it's a very good reminder that um, we can, there's lots of information about what to do, but unless we change our relationship and unless we value the natural environment and we value people, um, we won't have the energy or the drive to, to use the information to live in a way that um, saves water. So what role can faith communities play in encouraging a value shift from materialism and competition to well-being and cooperation? Thank you. Um, and I look forward to seeing communities of faith working together to start a tidal wave of change for eco justice and care for the earth. Thank you, Kim. Um, yeah, it was really nice to see those pictures of examples um, of community alternatives. Um, we're going to move on, please. Um, everyone, if you do have any questions or comments, please note them in the chat box. There are still a few people whose names we can't see. There's, um, if you can't add your name to your Zoom account, please let me know or write your name on the in the chat box so that I can change it for you. Um, yeah, we would just like to see everyone's um, name and who's who's joining us today. Um, also, as Francesca has said earlier, it is for uh, data pur purposes. If you have received data, we would like to know that you are making the call. Somebody's hand is up, and that's the name that I I don't know who it is because your name can't be one if M seven O something. <laughs> Please add your name to the chat box. Um, who's whoever's hand is up. Thank you. Uh, we'll move along to um, Tendai Gurupira. Tendai, are you with us? Tendai? I know that she is with us. I'm sorry for those that ha that's having connection problems. It seems to be um, a lot in Zimbabwe and Malawi um, where there's connection issues. I know that one presenter, um, Evans from Zimbabwe is also having an issue uh, connecting. Can I just check if Tendai is here with us now?
Okay, so I'll wait for I'll wait for Tendai to respond. Um, but we will have to move on. And I see Andrew is um, on the call. Andrew. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Would you mind doing your oh there you are. Would you mind doing your presentation first, please? I think others are um, having an issue connecting now. Sign up. Yes. Could I'm just share? opening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I'm just going to introduce you, um, Andrew. Uh, so Reverend Andrew uh, Gwambe is from Malawi, and he is a, a Fleet One member who we know for very long that does amazing work. Um, and he's obviously going to speak about his projects um, in Malawi around water efficiency and conservation. Um, thank you, Andrew, for joining us today. Thank you, Zainab. Um, it's a great pleasure for me today to have this privilege to share. Apologies, last time when Zainab gave me an opportunity to offer a prayer, but it was difficult uh, with the connections here in Malawi. So welcome everyone. Um, Andrew Gwambe, as she said, um, one of the first fleet members. I would be sharing about the Malawi in context of water efficiency and conservation. Um, let me say that uh, um, as a way of introduction, Malawi has got uh, lots of water reserves. We have Lake Malawi and uh, we have um, lots of other big rivers in Malawi. And the uh, water is not really a big issue at the moment, but when we look at future because of the increased population, there'll be lots of problems uh, with water and how people are using water is really very pathetic because they don't really care about the how to use water efficiently. So, uh, about Malawi, then I'll go further. Could you go to introduction, Zainab? So the, my presentation layout is uh, introduction of this. Then we are saying Malawi suffers from depletion of natural resources and water, um, including included. So there is a lot of uh, natural resources depletion. Depletion in Malawi. We are talking of uh, environmental um, depletion in terms of uh, forest cover and the other things. And water is included. Because you could find people cultivating along the river banks, and you could find people building houses, people want to build their infrastructures there. So, so this is also this is uh, can you hear me, Zainab? I can, Andrew. Sorry, can I just ask um, people if they are not um, presenting to mute their mics? Um, it takes a while for us to see the person and then mute their mics from our side. So please leave your mic off if you are not presenting. Um, Andrew, your, your connection is a bit wobbly. Uh, maybe you can um, switch off your camera so we can hear your voice clearly. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much, Zainab. Okay. Yes. Yes, so um, like what I wanted is by way of introduction is say there's a lot of uh, depletion of natural resources and the water included. 
So I was giving examples of people infrastructure, building infrastructures in, in, in places where there's like wetland and the, the water catchment areas, and also people opening up gardens along the river banks and the many other places. So this is a big problem, it's causing a lot of problems in terms of water scarcity in the future. So last year, the country launched the Malawi Vision 2063 and the visions a Malawi of self-reliant industrialized upper middle income country by the year 2063. This is a very powerful document. And, and in fact, the only trouble is that as many people always say is that Malawians are good at producing very good documents, but the problem. So I hope this time, this 2063 vision uh, has been publicized widely. I'm sure they are aware we we'll become self-reliant and country and industrialized upper middle income country by the year 2063. But if, unless we look at environmental issues seriously. Environmental sustainability has been included in the Malawi 2063 vision. It said and contained just in summary that the country shall have clean, secure and sustainable environment. So this is good because the environmental issues have been taken care of. But as I said, it all depends on the implementation. There are also noticeable issues the country has to deal with, which include limited awareness of environmental best practices, data gaps and limited funding, weak institutional capacities and coordination, just to mention a few. So these are some of the things that uh, have been mentioned in the document. And in fact, there are some strategies that uh, have been um, highlighted. So I'm hoping that uh, SAFSE and uh, our cooperation with Malawi will also help to, for us to achieve this ambitious Malawi Vision 2063. It's, it's good that we're already having partnerships with SAFSE because those are some of the things that have been mentioned in the document that is need for institutional partnerships to be created. Yes, we can move on. Second slide. Oh, sorry, let me just do this again. Sorry, I don't know what happened there, but I seem to have lost the icon. So there, there are some ways that would help to increase water efficiency. Uh, but I'm shocked the way I heard Kim um, uh, presenting, there are lots of things that we can do, even just, it, it just um, uh, if to add on what I've just suggested here. And uh, the first point is to replace order or high flow water clauses and flash valves with the uh, models that meet current UPC and the, these are uh, international standards. So we don't worry about this UPC, IPC. You try dual flash valves on water causes and consider replacing existing plumbing fixtures with the high efficiency fixtures that exceed UPC and is a requirement. So these are some of the suggested ways how we can increase water efficiency. Practically, I've done this at my house. The last time, Kim visited Malawi, we had one week spent together and we moved into some mosques and churches. And I had a picture of the practical ways how you could do, um, improve your water efficiency. So I've tried this personally at home. Here is a picture, if you can look at the picture. The picture is a woman throwing away some dirty water, gray water. So let me talk of water efficiency and the conservation definition. So by water efficiency, 
uh, I think I'll, I'm referring to reducing water wastage by measuring the amount of water required, particularly for the particular purpose and the amount of water used or delivered. So actually that's what I'm trying to refer to as water efficiency. I, I know Kim has done it well in the guide, it's also there. And water efficiency differs from water conservation. So in Malawi, it is very common to talk about water conservation focused on reducing waste, not restricting use. So the, 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 the issue is here, um, I want to say that when we are talking of water conservation in Malawi, we are talking of um, providing good practices for farming. Mostly this is the way it is referred to farming where you could create some check dams where water is flowing, then they could be slowed down, the water will be slowed down, the speed will be slowed down a little bit by those check dams at different strategic points. So that helps to conserve water and ensure that water sinks into the ground. And there are so many other ways that we do. And, and in fact, water conservation is also the constructing of dams and the uh, and also is referred to uh, rainwater harvest. People can collect water from their roofs during um, rainy season. So this is uh, how Malawi is approaching water efficiency and in fact in connection with water conservation because these things have to go together. Because if you can't conserve water, then we may suffer future, the future generation will also suffer. Okay, let's go to another slide. So there are also ways, uh, they, uh, uh, um, okay, this uh, same thing, eh? but more <laughs> expanded. So I think the regular checking of water taps, if they are properly closed and checking any leakages in the plumbing system, use a cup when brushing your teeth, use any gray water for gardening or lawn watering. These are some of the packages or things that we are able to do as Malawians. And probably the first things we are talking about uh, replacing older high flow, we are talking of the people living in town and cities where they have where tap, they use tap water. But for people who are in the villages, we would actually advocate that they should recycle. They should use gray water for gardening or other uses. And probably they could use a, a cup. Normally they use a cup in the villages, but in town, that's where the problem is. People would leave a running water on a tap, a tap running water, because they have a phone call. So they leave and come back and find the water is just flowing because they were brushing their teeth. So there are a number of scenarios that happens if, if you are not using a cup to brush your teeth, you end up forgetting and you keep water running. So that would not help us in terms of increasing water efficiency. And as I said, checking leakages in the plumbing system uh, we are like in town where this tap water, the system goes a long way from the main source up to different parts of the, the, the house. You just need to watch the walls. If they are wet, then you could see that there's a problem. Then you need to call for a plumber and do something about it. Let's continue. Yeah, so water conservation interventions, as I said earlier, I said we are promoting construction of dams, small dams, and the rainwater harvesting, the water tanks. And we try to practice smart agriculture to prevent land degradation. And we make check dams to control runoff water and enforce laws that um, forbids people from sand mining. Water recycling is also another point. But the only challenge is when you talk of enforcing laws that forbid people from sand mining. We have seen a lot of, um, uh, we have seen a lot of fight. We have seen a lot of fight between the like, the people responsible for forestry, the people because of lack of understanding. So that will forbid people from 
doing sand mining. Sand mining is just an example. There could be a number of things. So there are strategies, good strategies that can be employed. Some of the strategies include promotion of good catchment management to protect and sustain the ecosystem by the vesite and the wetlands. Also promotion of water harvesting and conservation to make water readily available throughout the country for sustainability of social economic development and the natural environment. Advocating effective and efficient utilization and management of water resources, promoting and initiating strategic and contingent water resources development and management schemes at national and the river catchment levels. Empowering of communities to effectively and efficiently manage water resources. Promotion of investments in water resources management in all water related programs, whether publicly or privately funded. Ensuring compliance by all stakeholders with water sector policies, laws, standards, and guidelines. These are some of the things that I wanted just to share that could be part of the strategies that if we, they are fought, then we could see ourselves improving our water efficiency and the water conservation. Let's move up. Uh, my appeal is that the fleet members be responsible to provide the technical expertise on water efficiency and conservation with support from the surface and the government. Fleet members, we are so privileged. The presentation Nikki made is marvelous, is really very helpful. And if we could tap that knowledge and share with others in Malawi. I'm sure Malawi would not face serious problems in terms of the water scarcity. And the, this technical expertise that staff is imparting on us, we need to appreciate so much because it's timely. There are lots of problems in Malawi in terms of future, how we will contain the growing population. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I know. I couldn't do it myself, but with support from Zainab. Zainab has always been helpful to me and a long time friend. So once again, thank you very much for listening and Zainab with your team, make a trip, come to Malawi and see the new Malawi now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. It's, it's just scary going out of our homes these days. I wish I can go to Malawi so easily. Um, thank you very much. That was a very, very um, well presented uh, presentation. Um, and thank you for sharing your experiences. Um, as I've said earlier on, please, all questions and comments, please put them in the, um, in the chat box and we will get to them when everyone has been, um, has shared the presentations. Um, Martin, thank you very much for appreciating us. We appreciate you too. Obviously, we can't be here without you to do the work. Um, we'll go on to Tendai. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Zainab. Hello, Tendai. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm sorry, I don't have um, something to uh, which I prepared because of time, but I'm going to share what we do in the United Methodist as I do my work, mostly when I meet people and what we are doing during this COVID-19 in giving awareness to our people on water conservation in our household, and in our institutions, we have got uh, more than 20 uh, missions, schools in our church. So we have uh, so many people, so many people's school children who are in our mission center. So we give awareness. And what I do uh, mostly when I'm doing some programs, even if it is a different program, which is not on a uh, um, based on uh, keeping the earth, I just give the information. So 
what I prepared, I prepared on water conservation, which uh, we give to people. Uh, we tell them that it is very important because uh, fresh, clean water is a limited resource in, as well as costly. In the awareness, we tell them to check on toilets for leaks, what has been said, because these small things, when we just see the water leaking in a toilet, we just take it uh, as something very small and we just think there isn't a lot of water which is being lost, but a lot of water will be lost. So we encourage them to fix the, the, the toilets when they are leaking. We also tell them to stop using the toilets as waste baskets or ashtrays. You know, people at times, they put a lot of uh, tissues in the toilet and flushing each time and again the toilet, especially uh, children, when we are at churches, there are times, at times they put things in the toilet and they'll be interested in just flushing the toilet, thereby uh, wasting a lot of water. We also encourage them to take shorter showers when, ba when bathing, to take shorter showers because if one takes a long um, uh, shower, you'll be wasting a lot of water. We also teach them to install water and saving, uh, saving shower heads or flow uh, reservation. What we do, we tell them that they, they must have uh, showers to use and to buy them in shops, they are very cheap uh, than using the tub where one uh, spends a lot of water waste. Um, we also take, um, tell them to take baths using buckets at times or dishes or encourage them not to fill the whole tub. At times you see that someone would need to fill the whole tub when one is at home. The next person takes the uh, uh, full tub, thereby wasting a lot of water. And we also encourage them to use the, that, uh, to reuse the water uh, when, which they have used. It. Um, we also tell them to turn off the water while brushing the, their teeth, like what has been said or using a tumbler or a cup. At times you see that when one wants to brush teeth, when what we do mostly at home, you see that one will open the tip and uh, uh, brush the teeth when the water is running. So we encourage them to save water by just putting in a cup or a glass or a tumbler, then use to clean the teeth. We also tell them to turn off the water while shaving to men, at times we see that one when one wants after shaving, one wants to 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 wash. We encourage them that just to put a warm water, a few warm water in the sink, so that one can use, so that it won't waste a lot of water. Uh, when using automatic dishwashers, we encourage people to 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 fill the the whole load. When you see that we have filled the whole load, that is when we should wash. Not to say that when you have five or six plates, you start running the, the, the dishwasher, you lose a lot of water. We also talk about uh, rinsing vegetables. At times we see that when people want to wash vegetables, they rush, wash them in, on, a, on running water. But we encourage to put water in the bowel, then soak your your vegetables, then wash them, thereby saving a lot of water. We also uh, talk about keep, keeping bottle of drinking water in the refrigerator. This puts a short, uh, a stop to the wasteful practice of running tap water to cool it for drinking. If you wash dishes by hand, don't leave the water running for rinsing. You see that mostly people, when they are washing dishes, when they are rinsing, they will use the running water. But we encourage 
uh, our members that when you have two things, put the other one, which you use your dishwasher, then the other one for, for rinsing your plates so that you won't waste water. Uh, we also talk about checking pipes for leaks uh, outside the home because it, it wastes water 24 hours a day, seven days a week. People would just think when the water is leaking outside and mostly people don't check. So we encourage people to go and check at their pipes if there is uh, water which is leaking. Water, um, we also talk about the water. When people are watering water, or are putting the lawn, when you want to, to water the lawn, only just the water the lawn when there is need, when there is need and we encourage uh, people not to put the whole garden uh, of lawn. We also tell them to deep soak the lawn. Water during the water parts of the day, um, when it is early in the morning, we encourage them to water their lawn when it is still in the morning because it helps to prevent the growth of fungi. We also talk about positioning of the sprinklers so that water lands where it is needed. At times we see that when water, people want to water the lawn or in the garden, they just leave the sprinklers and they will go to, to, to put water where it is not needed. So we encourage them to put the, the, the hose on the right position where it is going to sprinkle the water where it is needed. We also talk about avoiding watering on windy days because when it is windy, the water will be uh, taken to uh, other places where it is not needed. We encourage our members to plant, plant drought resistant trees, plants and flowers so that they won't use a lot of water. We also talk uh, to help them to put a layer of mulch around trees, plants, or even the garden, because it slows the evaporation of moisture. Thereby, you won't uh, be watering your plants each time and again, thereby saving water. We also talk about using a broom to clean dry, uh, driveways inside uh, walks. Uh, it, instead of using a hose, it wastes a lot of water. Do not use the hose pipe while whilst washing the car. Mostly people use the hose pipe when they are cleaning the cars, thereby losing a lot of water. We encourage just to put water and soap in a bucket, then clean the, 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 the car. When you are rinsing, that is when you can use um, the wash pipe to rinse, thereby saving water. We encourage our members to tell children not to play with the wash or spilling glass, because children, if you just leave them, they will waste the water. Running, uh, when using, running uh, when using washing machine we also encourage people that when they are using the washing machine it's better to 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 use it when it is fully loaded when we have a lot of clothes to wash so that you won't waste a lot of water why do we need to conserve water it's important because it keeps water pure and clean while protecting the environment. Conserving water involves restraining from water pollution. We don't want pollution. It minimizes the efforts of drought water shortages. It also guides against rising costs.
Tendai, are you still on the call? Tendai? Oh, I think, uh, well, Tendai has been having uh, network issues um, as well as many people in Malawi and um, Zimbabwe. So apologies for that. I, I am going to ask her to, um, because she has read through through a presentation, <clears throat> um, but I am going to ask her to send uh, the presentation and those wonderful, wonderful reminders uh, so that I can share it with, with everyone. Um, could I just check, and this is another long shot, could I just check if Evans is with us, um, who's doing another presentation uh, presentation from Zimbabwe as well. So I'm just checking, Evans, are you on the score? I don't see. Oh, are you there, Tendai? Yes, I'm there. Okay. I was about to, <laughs> very sorry. I was about to finish and I was talking on why we need to conserve water. Uh, I was on that uh, uh, we need to conserve water because it reduces pollution and in conserving fuel resources. If we save water now, we are helping to ensure water supply adequate for future generations. Saving water saves money. What we are also doing, the work which I do, we are also uh, sourcing funds to drill boreholes in our institutions. I have this, I had this first speaker telling that uh, boreholes at times they are a problem. Uh, we have to do it because in our institutions, like I said we've got more than 20 institutions. There is, there are no rivers which are there, there are no dams which are there, but we are being helped by the boreholes which we, drilled so that the people in those communities can use. So after drilling the boreholes, we also tell them and educate them so that they should use the water uh, wisely so that they won't waste the water. That is what we are doing in United Methodist Church. I thank you for giving me this opportunity to share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tendai. Th those were wonderful examples, and it's and it's. Um, I think everyone can identify something um, that you have mentioned that we can use um, or make a change or an alternative to what we're doing already to conserve water. Um, uh, I was going to ask you. I know that you didn't do a presentation. Um, uh, so everyone can see. Is it possible that you can type it up so that I can share them with everyone? Sure, sure, I will. Thank I you very will, much. I will, I will email you. Thank you very much. Um, could I just check if Evans um, is on this call already? I'm just going to do a last check. He did. Um, yeah, he was also struggling because he's from Zimbabwe as well and network. Um, yeah, isn't, isn't, yeah, the network isn't working with us today. Who's talking, not Evans. Okay, that's Galaxy J6. You're not Evans. Okay. So, uh, I'm Evan. What is it? There's Eva from Malawi and Eva from Zimbabwe. So, I thought it's one from Zimbabwe. Okay, no, it's, no I'm, I was looking for Ernest, uh, not Ernest, uh, for Evans. Um, he was supposed to do a presentation. Oh, fine. Okay, so seeing that we, we have some time, um, because, uh, because Evans okay. is not with us, we do have some time. I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, Chloe. Chloe, why is your name Justin? Hi, Sarah. Is my name Justin? Yeah, I just changed it now. I changed Justin's name to Justin, and I probably did it 
to your name. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to ask Plo to break us up in um, six groups of 10, because we 62, that's without Plo and myself, um, six groups of 10. Um, and, and the things that we've covered from the, pre from the um, presenters um, that, we've, that we've heard this morning on ways to, to reduce or alternatives to water um, and examples of water conservation. Um, I know that there's a, a lot of experience and examples in this room. So when you come together in your, and, and in, in your group, share with each other what examples you have. Um, and then we will we'll be able to listen to all the countries that's that's on this call and get some um, some context uh, some contextual experience as well. So the question is, what examples do you have on water conservation in your community or in your country? Um, some it could be something that you're thinking about doing but haven't and thought that was a good um, example um, or something that you wanted to do. Um, yeah, so hold on and please accept the room that you're going into. So I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with this. with oh i have opened up the rooms uh can you please just say yes as the oh okay yes yeah. i have opened up the rooms thank you i'm seeing something come up on my screen with names and the rooms oh yes um it just shows you who's in which room is that what okay. you're seeing yeah yes. yeah thank and you who's, and who has accepted and not accepted um so for example, Simplex has not joined a room. Zainab has not joined a room. Yeah. Um, Clo, is, is there a way that you can let the rooms know that um, they have about 15 minutes before coming back? Yes. Thank you. So I'm just going to step away for two minutes. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you had some good discussions um, and, and able to share with everyone um, examples so we can all learn from each other. Uh, this is obviously not SAFSI bringing in um, the only um, solutions or the expertise into the room, but we're all experts and we all have examples of um, how to conserve water. Um, so um, group six has asked to present first because um, someone has to leave Reverend Perry. Um, I think you have to leave and you've been asked to, pre to, to present on behalf of group six. So we'll go with you first. Thank you so much, Zaina. Thank you, everybody. We had a lovely discussion in group six, although some people were experiencing network problems. I'm sure that's possibly because of the Cape Town weather today. So one of the points that came up for me was um, firstly, James was talking about how we must teach our children and he makes a point of teaching his children to care for the trees and, and it's become a daily activity to, um, to water the garden, care for the trees. But also he says that the problem is not water availability, but the quality of the water. So there has to be a change of mindset around how to treat the water and what we put into the water. That was also um, underpinned by um, or emphasized by Anduli, who said that um, the water, there's not a shortage of water in Malawi, but there is waste and incorrect usage and obviously pollution is an issue as well. So change of behavior and teaching the children is are really important. Ernest brought up a really important interesting points around the irrigation system, which makes me think of the industrial farming regional interfaith dialogue on Wednesday, and I hope people will come to that. But um, it's in things like, instead of spraying your crops or your gardens 
to use drip irrigation. If you have larger crops to, to, to install drip irrigation so that um, the water is focused, it doesn't waste, there's no runoff, and it goes to exactly where it's needed in the crops. And then um, Gabriel also said that especially with small scale gardening with people in their homes, gray water is being used. Um, so basically you're using your gray water from your home to create food, which, um, which makes a better life cycle of water. Thank you. That was the discussion. And um, I hope that I have represented the group well. Thank you very much, Reverend Berry. That's a very good point that um, that the water water quality um, is, is a big, big issue. Um, thank you, everyone that says that they had good um, good discussions in their group. Could I ask um, someone from group one? Uh, hello, Zainab. Hi, Ibrahim. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And how are you? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, well, I'm representing uh, group one. Well, in group one, where we uh, discussed that uh, in Malawi, especially in Kota Kota, they are sensitizing people to embark on um, organic farming. Um, the main reason being that uh, in organic farming pollutes our water bodies. So moving on to organic farming, I, at least you are going to prevent uh, uh, polluting our water bodies. Uh, the next point is on uh, planting trees uh, along rivers. Uh, this will cover the, the land and also um, prevent um, uh, water surface runoff. Um, we also discussed about um, fixing leaking pipes. Um, uh, uh, when we, for instance, if you have a pipe that is, uh, a that is best, you have to report so that they can be fixed to avoid uh, wasting water. Also, someone also uh, said that uh, at home level, you are advised uh, to turn off uh, the, the tap when you are brushing your teeth. And as we discussed earlier on, that we, we should also use um, cup when uh, brushing our teeth. The other point is on um, proper disposing of uh, wastes. Uh, they are sensitizing people on how to uh, dispose the wastes uh, properly, not just throwing papers anyhow, um, this will end up contaminating the water bodies. Also um, promoting uh, drip irrigation to, uh, as opposed to flood irrigation. Uh, lastly, but not least, um, this is uh, from someone uh, came up with this idea from South Africa, that there should be at least a street monitoring so that um, those who are living in the streets, uh, they should be um, having water, quality water. And also if they are leaking pipes, those pipes should be fixed uh, properly. So there should be at least someone from the government or from the, the water board department to make sure that even those in the streets uh, are having um, good water. Thank you. This is what we have um, in group one. Thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim Yasin. Um, yeah, all, all great examples and um, uh, solutions and advocacy strategies. So thank you for that. Um, can I, we have group two? Who was in group two? Do you, I can talk, I was in group two, this is Kim. Hi Kim. Um, we had very good inputs um, from Zabaya, um, basically around um, gardening and planting and so using water most effectively to, um, yeah, so the drip watering, mulching, planting in holes where you can focus the water around the holes. Um, and then there were, um, we also had talks about water tanks. Um, there, are po there are water tanks, plastic ones in Malawi, but apparently they are quite expensive. There are maybe options to build cement ones to harvest water. Um, I liked Sabaya's comment about use water more than once and the final use should be the garden. Um, yeah, so most of our discussion was about 
um, using water in the garden, which is basically keeping the water in your own local environment um, and being very, very cons conservation minded in the use of it or very efficient. Uh, the only the ones I shared was um, that uh, with the day with the terrible drought we had, we took the lid off our toilet system, and um, we used to flush the toilet with grey water. And we've carried on doing that. Mm -hmm. I just want to make a comment about a dual flush. A dual flush is fine in um, big commercial centres, but at home it's actually a problem because you can't take the lid off. Um, the dual flush mechanism is attached to the lid. Um, so if you really want to use grey water, you need to take the lid right off. Um, and then you can't because then you break the dual flush system. So actually for a home use, an ordinary small system is better. Thank yeah, you. That's our contribution. Okay. I don't know if uh, any of the others would like to add anything. We didn't have a formal leader. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Um, um, in terms of time, uh, I'm not going to go back to group two just to hear if there's others because there's um, other four, I think four other groups to present. Um, Sebia, it's so good to see you on this call. So Sebia Kar Karamba, um, who you just mentioned now, Kim, is a good, uh, very active earthkeeper. So welcome, Sebia. It's good to see you on this call. Can we go to group three? Hello, Anyone? Hi, Precious. Yes, yes. Are you hearing me? Yeah, can hear you. Oh, yeah. I'm Precious Jonas representing Group 3. Thank you. Uh, actually, in our group, we target mostly on our domestic purposes for domestic use, home, house, household. From there, we had a point of reuse where we said, what are used for a particular domestic purpose could also be reused for a relevant purpose. Like, uh, for example, Water used for washing could also be used for mopping or clearing vehicles and other relevant household goals like that. Chose, I mean. Two, we had another point from Zimbabwe where I said harvesting land water, harvesting. From there, due to network problems, we, he didn't come out and clarified that. So I want to mention a lot. And uh, we also had a point from Emmanuel. He said that uh, sometimes partial usage of water could also help. There he said, uh, mopping today, then switching to another another day, like you know, from Monday to Wednesday or Thursday, at least uh, mopping the house three times per week could also manage to conserve water. That's from group three. Sign up? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, yeah. my fingers can't get to the buttons quickly. Thank you very much, Precious. Uh -huh. Thank you for representing your group. Uh, can we have group four? Good morning. Hi, happy. Thank you. Um, I'm Happy Mbewi, and I'm representing uh, Group 4. Uh, in our room, we had a, a, a successful discussion. So these are the points that we came up with. Number one, we said planting trees along river banks so that the rivers should be covered, should be green to conserve the uh, flow water there so that we can have more water throughout the year. Number two, we talked of using cup and bucket for toilet hygiene. We said instead of, for example, when you flush a toilet, you lose five liters of water at once. If you can use a cup and a bucket, at least the usage and the, and the amount of water wasted can be reduced. And also we said, we came up with the point to say, connect the sink water to the toilet tanks. So this one, we need the, uh, the design, designers to design well when making these uh, uh, facilities so that the water from the sinks, the used water from the sinks can be uh, collected and directed to the uh, toilet tanks so, so, so that uh, the used water can be used for flushing the toilet. And also, we talked of what uh, purification is going to be at board. Am I here? We talked of water purification and recycling, where we said 
uh, the water from the septic tanks, from the sewage systems can be uh, recycled and collected and put again into the water system for reuse. And also we talked of water harvesting systems. Uh, uh, actually we're talking of rainwater harvesting systems. So uh, we are talking of harvesting water from the rains, uh, for example, from the uh, roofs and also the runoff. Uh, it encompasses different uh, um, uh, systems like uh, roof water, runoff. So we are talking of building dams. Or in all, we are talking of harvesting the rainwater so that after the rains, we can still have a more stored water to use for some two, three months ahead. And also on top of that, we, so we said we should uh, use uh, water uh, utilization efficiency. That's to conquer with our friends who have said, for example, we use water for bathing. That water from the bathroom outlet can be used for some kind of agriculture. Uh, for example, the kitchen gardens or can be directed to a certain small dam within the household to be used for some um, agricultural uh, activities. On you, uh, we also uh, rounded it up to say for all these things to happen, there is need of training the community to embrace water conservation measures. So for all these practices to be practicable, it means we have to train the community to embrace these uh, techniques. Because as Kim said in her presentation to say, we need to have community-based water plans. So for this to happen, we have to go back to the community, empower the community, assess to, to the community to embrace all these uh, technologies. Thank you so much from group four. Thank you very much, Happy. I'm just thinking now that one presenter couldn't make it um, and we've adopted, what, six presenters now over the last 30 minutes. And I think sometimes things are just a blessing in disguise because now we hear all these wonderful, rich and amazing um, examples. Thank you very much, Happy. Um, could we go to group five, please? Anyone in group five want to present? Come on now, group five. Yes, uh, in our group, we had um, connectivity um, problem. Hi, Catherine. But then we wanted, first of all, to answer the question. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Please go ahead. I can hear you. Oh, OK. Yes, in our group, we wanted first of all to answer the question, what examples of water conservation do you have in your country? And so from the group, we wanted to have, go from each country, we, we have an example at least. But then because we had the connectivity problem, we ended up um, having one example uh, of having um, to harvest water from rain, whereby, uh, in Malawi, containers are put or water tanks on the roof to harvest uh, rainwater and then use buckets for bathing, washing, and cleaning dishes. And also, we talked of uh, tree planting al al along the rivers. And so, Catherine, are you still with us? You, 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 you on Zoom, Kath, uh, Catherine? Ah, you on, we all on Zoom. You on mute. Catherine, are you able to um, unmute or are you done? Okay. Okay. 
Are you able to hear me now? Yes, but your connection is a bit bad. Let's see. Yes. Did you okay. on what I have, can say something? Yeah. Maybe from okay. my group. Go ahead, go ahead. Or switch off your camera, switch off your camera, and then we'll try your voice only. Okay, I've switched off my camera. We can hear you much better, thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, I was saying, we concentrated on the question that says, um, the question you asked, what example of water conservation do you have in your country? And mm -hmm. so we want each country to get an example. But then because of uh, poor connectivity, we just had one, uh, two examples whereby um, water put during rain season are put on the roof to harvest rainwater. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, we use um, this same water. We use buckets, sorry, for bathing, for washing, and cleaning dishes. That's how water is conserved uh, in Malawi. And then we talked of tree planting along uh, rivers. And um, maybe from my group, because we didn't finish. So because of poor connectivity, maybe from my group, because we didn't finish, somebody can add one or two things. Okay, let me just check if somebody wants to add um, something because we are also running out of time. Okay. Um, let me just quickly check anyone. And if anyone wants to add something, we'll only do it. We'll give it two minutes. Hello. Hello. Yeah. In fact, I wasn't part of the group, but um, in terms of water harvesting, I think if you cope from what is actually happening um, in um, Israel, uh, mm -hmm. you'd find out they've got underground uh, water tanks. Instead of letting the water, rainwater uh, go as runoff, they actually harvest that water for future use. So if we build underground um, water tanks, it could help and save us. Um, during uh, drought periods. Mm -hmm. So I think as uh, Southern Africa, this is also what we should also try and do in our various countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Justice. It's good to hear your voice. We've been chatting for a while, but we've never um, spoken really. So thank you for that contribution. Um, anyone else? Okay, I think we're gonna stop. Uh, stop it here. Thank you, everyone. Again, it was such a blessing not to have. Well, I'm not going to say that the that the third presenter couldn't make it. That wasn't the blessing, but the blessing was what we got out of it was all these rich contri contributions from other countries, from people, from the participants, um, and your voice as well, um, because obviously we don't know it all you know what's happening in your country. So thank you very much for, uh, for that. Um, I will try and send, um, I'm very bad with communication these days because to, to, to answer everyone's requests and emails um, was a bit hectic last week, but I will try and send presentations. So those who have presented, um, Kim Tendai and um, uh, uh, Reverend Andrew Gwambe, if you could share your presentations with me, I have Andrew's already. Um, I will then send it to, to everyone um, that's on the school. So thank you very much for, for coming today. We have learned so much from each other. Um, and from the presenters. Um, I'm gonna ask Sheikh Ishmael. I know you're listening. I can see you. Would you mind closing us with a prayer? Yeah, no, I will we'll pray. Shall we pray? Uh, thank you, Lord, for the time you gave us today. We know, we have visions. But if you don't accept, we are nothing. Lord, we thank you for the time. 
and the knowledge we have shared here. Lord, it's our anticipation to meet on the 30th of July. So accept from us. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Sorry for putting you on the spot. I appreciate it. So thank you, everyone. I hope everyone has learned something and are able to put that, put only one thing into action. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Until we see each other next week, where we will talk about your eco footprint, looking at uh, waste management. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. Uh, sorry, Chloe. Thank you. Thank you.